It's movie day at Grace and Truth. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Owen Strand and I will be your host. Please subscribe to this podcast on all platforms. I have the distinct privilege today of talking the new movie, Dune Part 2. Very exciting title there, Dune Part 2, with the managing editor of the Babylon Bee. His name is Joel Berry. He's known to many of you. He's a friend. I'm thankful for Joel. Good Christian brother. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Owen. It's, uh, I'm excited to talk about this today. Well, we formed our own movie club here, and uh, nice. you know, I saw I saw a tweet from you uh, a little bit ago, a couple weeks ago, I think it was when Dune Two first came out. And uh, you're a, you're a Christian. Before we dive into Dune Part Two, in all seriousness, you're a Christian who loves engaging art. From what I know of you, you uh, you yes. have an eye toward that. We both want to do that morally, of course, and and other things we could say. But fundamentally, why do you enjoy movies and? Uh, how long have you been tracking movies like Dune 2? Um, oh man, I, I love movies. Um, and I, I think the, the thing, I, I guess the, maybe if you could distill it into one, uh, thing that kind of encapsulates why I love movies, why I love stories, why I think they're so important. Mm. I would just point you to J.R.R. Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. Mm. Um, and um, and also some conversations that he had with C.S. Lewis. Um, you know, I, I love the way that uh, movies, films, um, stories, myths communicate truth. I love the way that they can um, kind of sneak past our our, our biases and the, the things that we think that we believe uh, to present truth in, in ways that we didn't uh, didn't expect. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, you know, Tolkien talked about uh, stories and uh, particularly myth as being a way for human beings to gl have a, a glimpse outside the the four walls of the material world, a glimpse at the transcendent. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I love movies that do that. I, I you know, I, I love a good uh, Christ story. I love a good hero's journey. Um, you know, when when C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien were in their early conversations before, you know, C.S. Lewis became a Christian, um, you know, C.S. Lewis grew up as a child. He was a big lover of myth. Um, mm -hmm. He, when he was like, like in his preteen years, he created this whole world called Boxen with these animal characters that, um, that had all these backstories and, and, you know, politics and kingdoms and, and myth attached to them. And so he'd always loved myth and Tolkien simply, as he was kind of sharing Christ with Lewis, kind of pointed Lewis to the fact that these myths are pointing to something real. Mm. Um, you know, Christ, the story of Christ and the gospel is the true myth. It's the myth that came true. Every story that came before that was looking forward to it. Every story that we've written since has looked back to it. And, um, and he kind of pointed out to Lewis how you're moved by the meaning in these myths. Well, what is that? What are you being moved by? And, and kind of mm. started, Lewis started to realize that there was something else going on, you know, beyond the material. And so, um, I, for that reason, I, I love, I love movies. I love, um, I love talking about what a filmmaker or a writer is trying to say, whether they be Christian or, or secular. I, I think one cool thing about, you know, even secular movies, even movies made by people who hate God, people who are trying to, you know, um, you know, even craft messages that are anti-God. If they're an honest filmmaker and they're telling the truth, they can't help but point to God in one way or another. And I like to kind of distill mm. what some of those ideas are, because um, all truth is God's truth and, and good stories tell the truth. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I remember reading Greek mythology as a, as a boy, I was raised in a Christian home. So, you know, my, my parents weren't trying to make me a Zeus worshiper or something like that, <laughs> but you know, apart even from, from film, you, you got into story there and the meaning of story and, um, Christians aren't suspicious or scared of story. Uh, we fundamentally have a Bible. We often treat the Bible as if it's more of a encyclopedia and it certainly has lots of didactic sections, of course, teaching sections, but the Bible also has a whole lot of story. So, yeah. um, you were putting good words to it already, but just to add mine to yours, um, the Christian faith is not the Christian encyclopedia that we read out on a weekly basis. The Christian faith is a story. It is the true story. And it's a better story than any that could ever be imagined by the human mind. I, I love what you were after there with Tolkien. 
No, it's, it's so true. And, and what you find too, is that, um, oftentimes a, a, the, the quality of a movie or, or the amount that a movie resonates with an audience or is beloved by an audience is directly proportional to the amount that it reflects the true story, the true myth, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the story of Christ in one way or another, because it's, it's a story I think that, it, that is, it's written on all our hearts. We're made in God's image. We're made for God. We're made to, to seek God and desire God. Um, yes. and, um, whether we realize it or not, when we see a movie that reflects those truths in one way or another, our hearts respond to it. And sometimes we don't, mm -hmm. we don't know what's happening. We just say, Oh, that was a good movie. But I think there's something deeper going on there for sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of your own background, um, with Dune, uh, Dune, I read Dune again. I, I keep giving confessional moments about my boyhood. I remember discovering Dune, no, no joke at Porter Memorial Library in Machias, Maine, where I grew up. I grew up in this tiny town in Maine and I liked sci-fi. I was discovering that. I don't know how old I was, maybe junior high or something like that. And I got a hold of Dune. Probably someone recommended it to me. I've forgotten who, uh, and, and read the first book. I think I read books one through four or something like that. And it got, it got increasingly wild as, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, you know, the central figure, the kind of messianic figure, or is he an anti-messianic figure? I want to talk with you about that. Maybe yeah. he's both. Anyway, Paul gets, Paul gets, um, godlike powers and, and the narrative gets increasingly hard to follow, at least for a junior high boy. Yes. Did you, did, do you have a grounding with Dune or if not <laughs> Dune, do you have a grounding in sci-fi books? Were you a fellow geek growing up reading this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I grew up, uh, homeschooled and kind of sheltered. And, and so I didn't, I didn't, wasn't exposed to a lot of that. My, uh, my parents were very protective. Yeah. Um, my, the first sci-fi book I read as a kid was Ender's Game, um, mm -hmm. which, which I loved. Uh, the first sci-fi movie, which I would argue really isn't a sci-fi movie at all. It's a, it's a myth fantasy movie is, is Star Wars and Star Wars captured my imagination. Um, yes. and so I, it really wasn't until like junior high, high school, college, um, I, I kind of played catch up with a lot of this stuff, um, went back and watched all the great movies and, and I'm still in the process of trying to, uh, read all the great books. Um, sure. my Dune take. So the way I approached Dune, um, was I, I have been holding off on reading the books because I wanted to see the movies first. And I know that's backwards. Most people will tell you, read the book first and the movies are never as good as the book. But I, hmm. I, I don't know. I'm weird. I, I really love movies and I love to, I love to be able to judge a movie based on its own merits. And, um, whenever there's a, a movie coming out that's based on a beloved book, I always watch the movie first. I kind of appreciate it for what it is. And then I, I love going back to the book. And then hmm. what I, you always find is there's so much more richness and, and detail and, and things that are left out of the movie that you love. So you get to have two fun experiences that way. Instead of reading the book first and then being disappointed by the movie, you get to watch uh -huh. a great movie, you enjoy it, and then you go get to read a great book and it's like even better. And so I, I always, <laughs> I know people will probably yell at me for that, but I always watch right. the movie first and then I, I go back and read the book. <laughs> Yeah, you may have just said the most controversial thing anyone's going to say on these, <laughs> these episodes with you. Um, I, I will say I did that with Lord of the Rings when it came out. Mm. For whatever reason, I hadn't read the, the trilogy. I might I have too. read The Hobbit. Yep. And, and I will say um, what you just said held true in that there's all this richness that the movies really couldn't bring out. I mean, you, yep. you Jackson excised an entire character, Tom Bombadil, who's an important character. He doesn't, he's not exactly central to the developing plot, but anyway, um, so there is something to that, but that, yeah, you're definitely taking a minority position in saying <laughs> watch first, read second. I, I like it. Yeah. Cause I, well, what, what people usually say is, you know, you don't want to re watch the movie first because, you know, you want to be able to form that picture in your head in the book and, and make it your own. And I've never had a problem with that. I, I've never had a, like, I'm actually reading Dune right now. So I'm, mm. I'm in the middle of it. I okay. love it. I already love it way more than the movie. And I, I am interested to talk about that with you, but yep. I'm already forming a, a completely different picture in my head than what I saw in the movies. It's not remotely the same thing. It's like two different works of art. 
Uh, I don't picture uh, uh, Timothy Chalamet as I'm <laughs> when I'm reading about, you know, uh, yeah. Paul. So I uh, I still have the ability to kind of form my own thing, even though I've seen the movie. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I guess we'll kind of ease our way into this. I'm not. I'm not sure about Chalamet. Maybe it's because I'm I'm so starting to get slightly into old man territory or something, and he just seems so young to me. I, I guess I'm at that uh, crossroads I'll, in life. I'll say another I'll say another controversial thing for your podcast yeah. here. I think I think Timothy Chalamet is is a um, is a, the idea of an attractive man to a woman who's on birth control. <laughs> <laughs> I think w when the science says women who are on birth control are, are more attracted to, you know, more kind of soft and, and yeah. you know, mousy men. And so I think that's, I think that's the phenomenon we're seeing all these women who say they love Timothy Chalamet. It's cause it's cause of the birth control, <laughs> the hormonal yeah. birth control. Yeah. It, um, it, it, you can it cut really, that out if you want. Hey, <laughs> I don't no, want to get you in trouble. It all, we're leaving it all in. We're leaving it all in Joel. Um, um, yeah, Chalamet is, it, it seems to me, um, is part of uh, the, the inclusive vision that uh, I, I think it's Vill Villanueve. Villanueve. Yeah, well, however you pronounce that name. Yeah, v French guy. Villan Villeneuve? V I don't know. Villeneuve. You got to do like a E at the end. Yeah. E. I don't have the confidence to, to, to do French anyway. Um, there's a, there's a lacking in my software there, but I, I think, um, I think I really do think in terms of the Fremen in particular with Dune part two, what the director Denis Villeneuve is bringing out is, is really that, um, the, the guys and the girls are not that different. Um, the, yes. the fem shock here, shock alert for 2024. The female warriors are just as fearsome as the male warriors. It is yep. interesting to me. He seems to go back and forth with a lot of traditional things. Tell me what you think of this. Cut it to shreds. Mm -hmm. Agree with it. Whatever you want. It seems yep. to me that that the director goes back and forth. He affirms man woman uh, pairing, romantic pairing, um, uh, Paul and Sh and Shawnee. Um, so that kind of is a positive. Um, mm -hmm. but then he has them sort he has this inclusive vision of the Fremen where basically they're all the same. The guys and the girls don't look much different. They're just as fearsome warriors. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah. How would you evaluate that? Yeah, I, um, I think that that seems to be kind of probably the biggest problem that most people have with, with the movie. I, I, I will say that just from an immersion standpoint, um, the way he, um, he kind of had the Fremen, uh, cat, the way he casted them, it was just like, kind of like he just, it, just generic people of color. Like there were some were Nigerian, some were Spanish, some were, you know, yep. black, like it, he just, it's the fact that they weren't, you know, you have a society that's lived in the desert by themselves for 10,000 years. I, I think they'd probably all look the same. So, but he kind of, he made it feel right. a little bit more like midtown Manhattan, um, which, which kind of took me out of the immersion a little bit. And so, yeah. um, you know, and then th as far as the, um, the egalitarianism or, or the, the men being equal to the woman, um, I don't, I don't know the, from what I've heard in interviews with him, he has said that he, he did that because it's faithful to the book because Frank Herbert talks about how the Fremen are all equal and right. men and women are equal in this, in this culture. And, you know, Shawnee even has that really cringy, uh, speech halfway through the movie, the second movie where she talks about how, you know, what we do, we do for the good of all, we're all equal here. It's like a, you know, a, like yeah. a, a communist manifesto basically. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, you know, um, I think he's, he's probably just trying to be faithful to the themes and the vision of Frank Herbert. But mm. that raises a bunch of other questions because I think Frank Herbert in, in a few ways was confused himself um, oh, yeah. in, in the story that he wrote. So that, that brings up a whole lot of other uh, conversations, I guess. Yeah, it really does. I mean, obviously, um, if you read Herbert's works and if you read up on him, he's very anti-concept of Messiah. He strongly distrusts. Uh, those who would rise to lead uh, humanity in a kind of messianic way. Obviously, that's going to present mm -hmm. just a few minor uh, difficulties for the Christian faith. 
Um, he's also very ecologically focused and, you know, I try to reduce, reuse, recycle in my daily life or whatever. So I'm not down on that. Um, but he is very ecologically focused and, uh, mm -hmm. obviously a strong anti-capitalist bent in his mm -hmm. writing, um, that, that, you know, a Christian could probably say there's elements of that I can affirm. There's a lot of that I'm not going to affirm. Um, right. so yeah, it, it is a kind of, um, eccentric, uh, Marxist vision in some ways. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, he, I listened to a lecture that he delivered at UC Berkeley in the eighties. And I mean, he, he comes off, uh, he, he's a brilliant guy and he's extremely mm -hmm. creative and, and very fascinating to listen to the things that he, he thinks about and talks about. But he's also, I mean, as far as his worldview, it's very, you know, classic boomer lib 1960s, you know, the things that they were concerned about, like you said, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, yeah. you know, Nixon was, was the most uh, terrifying thing in the world. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think, the fact really the fact that he wasn't a Christian, <laughs> I think, held his story back from being something more. I think it could have been something more. Um, but, you know, so th there's so many things going on. The, the story it, is a bit confused and and I think different people take it differently. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of the way I break it down is that, you know, there are there are myths and there are dramas and, and it's on a spectrum. So on the myth side, you have Lord of the Rings in star Wars on the drama side, you have uh, stories like game of Thrones, um, which, you know, in, in the universe of game of Thrones, God doesn't exist. It's mankind. It's very nihilistic, um, mm. but it has the trappings of fantasy over here. You know, it, it, in myth, everything is, is imbued with meaning. And, yeah. and, uh, and points to something transcendent. Um, Frank Herbert kind of does this thing in the middle where he, he kind of, he, he, he takes the structure of a, of a myth and a, you know, a messianic story and he grounds it, um, in a very human kind of game of Thrones way, almost as, almost as if to say, this is what happens when human beings, um, mistakenly mythicize their reality. And I, th I think that that's mm. a, actually a good message and a good theme. I, you know, it's something that we see a lot now, as, like in wars, you see, you know, you see people with like the Ukraine and the Russian war, war. you know, mm. uh, you know, Ukraine is the rebel alliance and, and Russia is the evil empire or, you know, uh, Democrats, hashtag resist, where are the, where are the rebel alliance and, uh, you know, the Republicans are the evil empire or over in the Middle East. You know, I, I, I was I spent a year in the Middle East. I was in the Marine Corps. You know, Star Wars fans are in Fallujah, Iraq, you know, and they mm. consider themselves to be the rebel alliance against America's evil empire. You know, so mm. Um, mm. that I think m when you take a myth and you internalize it to to explain your own human story, I yeah. think that's dangerous because a myth is is meant to is not meant to do that. It's meant to tell the story, right? Um, and so, it, with the story of of Dune, I think the thing that's interesting about it to me is that you have um, you have human beings um, trying to replicate or or falsify or or create a, a counterfeit. A myth to explain their existence and, and justify the things that they do. You have the Bene Gesserit that plants false prophecies over thousands of years. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, in that sense, if you take it for what it is and for what Herbert intended it to be, it strikes yeah. me as like an antichrist story. It's like a, you yeah. know, um, and we know the, you know, there, there will be an antichrist. It'll be interesting to see, you know, I, I wonder what that will look like when it, when there is an antichrist and, you know, how, how, what stories will human beings tell to justify what that, what that person is doing? Hmm. Yeah. The, very interesting comments there. I appreciate those thoughtful, stimulating. Um, you've got Herbert using the trope of a Messiah with Paul taking that on upon himself as Dune 2 progresses. Uh, he rejects the messianic role. I'll just call it that. Um, early on, he just wants to mm -hmm. be a member of the Fremen, but then here's a really interesting, uh, feature of this, 
uh, Herbert's story and the story the director tells in order to save the Fremen from the Harkonnen, which is a real salvation that has to occur politically and militarily. He mm-hmm. does rally the people. He does become the figure, uh, the talisman of the Fremen. And so it struck me that there was a lot of ambivalence there, that there is at one and the same time, a genuine rallying of the people over our horrific conqueror, the Harkonnen. And, and I loved how Villeneuve <laughs> um, <laughs> presented the Harkonnen as deeply anti-life. I mean, there is a clear good and evil contrast, uh, at at least in this stage of the story. Baron Harkonnen is a horrific figure. There is no regard for life in the Harkonnen camp. Uh, You know, the powerful slaughter people around them, their servants at at Mm -hmm. the drop of a hat. Um, So that was a fascinating uh, contrast between Paul's mother uh, gestating the child. Uh, somebody said this is the most pro-life film in years on social media. And there's a yeah. point, I think that's, that's true. So you've got, you've got the Atreides household, what's left of it, gestating life in a woman's womb. It's very clearly a woman's womb. That's mm-hmm. interesting as well in 2024. That's a yeah, fairly strong yeah. statement <laughs> versus the Harkonnen slaughtering people left and right as if they're nothing. Yeah. Uh, and yet Paul is not ultimately going to um, deliver the goods on who he says he is. So it's at once a messianic, pro-messianic message to a degree and an anti-messianic message. Yeah. And that's what's interesting to me about it is that I, that's where I think the story gets most of its power from the messianic side of the story. And I, I think the people mm-hmm. that embrace Dune, particularly the first book, um, because I think the follow-up book, Dune Messiah, was Herbert's uh, attempt to try to really drive home the, the point that no, Paul's bad. You're not supposed to like Paul's bad. He's a bad guy. <laughs> but right, the first right. book, pe- people who just read the first book and enjoy it for what it is, most people I've talked to seem to have embraced it as a, just a, a typical messianic story, a, yeah. a, a hero's journey, um, and, and embrace Paul as a heroic character. And I, I, I don't know. I think that the story is a bit more enjoyable when taken that way, even if, uh, maybe not the way Frank, Herbert intended it. And that, that raises up another point too, because that, you know, whenever, whenever art is made, there are two things that are created. There is the thing that the artist intended to create. And there is the thing that the, the people who consume the art, uh, you know, what they, how they take it. And yes. sometimes those two aren't the same things. One of, one of my favorite examples is the matrix. The matrix is one of my favorite movies in the world. And it's a typical hero's journey, messianic, you know, Christ story, you know, we're in bondage to sin, we're blind and, you know, our eyes are open and we're saved. And it, it's, it's, I love it. I love the matrix. Um, um, it's rated R, so don't watch it if you're a Christian, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, if you, if you talk to the creators of, of that, uh, movie who are now trans, they were men when they made it and, and they're transgender now, um, they say that it's an allegory for, for gender transition, which I, I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if they intended that when they made the movie or not, but that's what right. they say. That's they say. That's what it's intended. And I'm like, no, no, I'm sorry. That's not what it means. You made a, you made a Christ story and mm-hmm. it's awesome. And it's not, <laughs> and it's an awesome story. So, um, I think there's a little bit of that that goes on with anything that's made. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Frank Herbert expressed a lot of angst, uh, after the first book, um, mm-hmm. apparently that people were embracing Paul as a messianic figure. And that's why he wrote this, the follow-up doom Messiah. He wanted to try to correct that. I think De- Denis Villeneuve, if I pronounce that right, um, mm-hmm. he, I, I watched a bunch of interviews with him too. And he, he said that, his, the tone that he, and the themes that he really brought out in the film were his attempt to try to be true to what Frank Herbert wanted. Yeah. Um, and so I think Dune 2 is probably a little bit darker and, and um, paints Paul in a little more negative light than, than most people who just read the book would have gotten. Yeah. Um, you know, so just watching the film on its own merits, having not seen the book, 
I was appalled. I was like, you know, okay, first of all, the Bene Gesserit are pure evil. They're like Satan. They're like in the background manipulating and tempting people. And then you hear mm-hmm. Lady Jessica talking to her, the preborn uh, baby in her womb. And she's like, I'm going to go for the weakest first. And I'll first I'll deceive the weakest. And then, you know, and then they'll spread it to their families. And then we'll, we'll spread this lie throughout the Fremen that Paul is this Messiah, you know, and it's very just like, I, mm-hmm. I got a, just such a dark, evil vibe from it. And then Paul, you know, two thirds of the way through the film, he he takes the water of life. He becomes, you know, he, he can see the future. He has these yes. kind of godlike powers, and like his character changes, in my opinion. Like he becomes a a creepy Borg leader who's leading a, a cult of deceived people um, hmm. to a mass slaughter. And um, and Shawnee, I, I look at Shawnee and. This is in the movie, not the book. In the, in the movie, I'm like, Chani is the only person who's standing up and is resisting the Borg assimilation and is showing integrity and is standing up against tyranny. And I'm like, okay, Shani is like the hero of this movie. And so I, I put yeah. this take out on Twitter and everyone was like, no, all the Dune readers, the book <laughs> readers were like, no, 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 this is, you know, <laughs> this is complete. You're seeing it all wrong. And so it's, it's interest. It's interesting how, you know, I think, the fact that I chose to see the movie before reading the books really did change my perception of it a lot. Well, I think what we've talked about, though, are the two levels uh, that you rightly identified. And we're talking about the film as a message. We're not I, I'm not we, we've, we're referencing the book, the books. Mm-hmm. But I think it's interesting to talk about the film and what its message is. Um I do think that I saw your take on the Bene Gesserit, and I do agree that they are a malevolent force in general. But it did strike me that um, part of what they produce is Paul leading an uprising of the Fremen, which does overcome the Harkonnen, uh, at least so far, in terms of where Mm -hmm. Dune is, Dune Part 2. We don't have Dune 3 yet. And so I actually thought they're – whatever the director himself intends – there's an interesting wrinkle there in terms of how Christians read providence, because there actually are evil uh, workings and evil deeds that are turned for good purposes. I don't necessarily mean that that Paul's journey is going to end up as heroic as it seemed to start. But nonetheless, even the Bene Gesserit trying to produce the Kwisatz Haderach, this this Messiah figure, it does overcome at least temporarily the ferocious evil of the Harkonnens. And I I think we're supposed to, I think the director wants us to see at least some of that. I think he wants us to see that the reign of the Harkonnens is a horrible thing. Yeah. But, but he's, he's probably postmodern in that he's ambivalent about the rescuer. The rescuer is not going to be pure good either. Right. I, well, that, I think that's, that brings up another really important point is that, um, Every, every atrocity and every evil, um, pretty much that, that we commit as societies, as countries, as individuals, um, in one way or another, uh, they often start out with good reasons or good intentions. Maybe we are mm-hmm. facing down something legitimately evil, um, mm-hmm. or legitimately wrong. Um, but when, when we try to defeat that evil apart from the power and the work of Christ, it turns into reciprocating evil. You know, we, we do evil right back and that's, that's how the endless cycles of bloodshed that you see, you know, in the middle East, for example, that's how they happen is it's just, it's just Mm -hmm. an endless cycle of blood, blood revenge and blood feud. Um, and the way I interpreted the story in watching the movie was that, you know, the true Messiah, we look at what Jesus did. Um, Many of his followers wanted him to defeat the Romans and become king of the Jews. Yes. Um, I watched Dune and I thought, this is a story that tells the tale of what if Jesus had rode into Jerusalem on the trium- in the triumphal entry and then um, gone into uh, Pontius Pilate's palace and slit his throat. Mm. Um that is, that is Dune to me. That's like the Mm. Christ figure that instead of sacrificing himself to save people from their sins, um, instead 
um, kills the tyrant and becomes the tyrant himself. Mm. Mm. Um, and so I, in, in that sense, I, I felt like it was a very powerful, um, antichrist story, Mm. um, that, that really draws from the power and the, and the yearnings that our hearts feel for the Christ story and for the Messiah, which explains why antichrists and false messiahs are so dangerous because it's, it's what Satan does. He he's, he's pulling on something very real, um, and, and then twisting it, um, to, to do more evil. Um, and so, yeah, (laughs) that that's rich, man, bro. That'll, that'll speak. I mean, you, yeah, you've got a Christ. If I can go, if we can go to the categories of Christology, for example, uh, along the lines of what you're saying, you've got a Christ in, in Dune, uh, at least is portrayed in this film again, who is all lion and no lamb. There's no mm-hmm. lamb dimension. And, and it's not like we can say the lambness of, oh, I'm talking about the true Jesus as portrayed in the Bible is like a minor footnote in his existence. He has come to lay down his life for sinners. That is why Mm -hmm. Jesus has incarnated, sent by the Father, and died on the cross, rose again. He's come to make atonement for our sins. And he is a lion, but he is his his lionness is equally met with his lambness. And and there's no you're right, there's no lambness in Paul Atreides. He he is all conqueror. And that is you're you're dead right, Joel. We'll wrap here in just a minute and then we'll maybe have another conversation if you have time. But mm-hmm. but the human heart, as shown to us by the disciples in the gospels, desperately wants the lion conqueror. I mean, that's just an innate instinct. It's wired in there. The human mind and the human heart know that things are not right. The, the human person experiences all sorts of suffering and pain and brokenness and sin and oppression, genuinely, not fake, because of that reality. And yes. thus, we want the overthrow of evil. And that's not a stupid yearning. It is right to not want the Harkonnens to put you in a weird, uh, you know, white uh, outfit and then slit your throat whenever they want or the, the yeah. baron to sexually abuse you or whatever. I mean, horrible stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the solution to that, from from the scripture as you, as you've pulled out here, is not to have a pure lion, a, a lion alone. It's to have a lamb and a lion. Yeah, and that's <laughs> uh, among many other reasons. That's how I know the gospel is true because no one on earth could have made this story up. I mean, <laughs> like no one saw it coming. Jesus's closest followers didn't see it coming. You know, they no. were expecting the lion. They they wanted. I mean, I. Imagine how offensive it must have been um, to be living under the oppression of the Romans and then to hear Jesus say, um, if a Roman soldier tells you to carry his shield a mile, you need to carry it two miles. Like, yes. <laughs> um, and then instead of after riding into Jerusalem, saying he'll, he can tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days, and then he just dies. I mean, uh, yeah. imagine just the absolute confusion and fear that mu- those those people must have experienced um only to see the resurrection i mean it 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 is the it is the king um that we needed um and we didn't even know it um yes. and it's it is every good story mm-hmm. points back to that um and so it's i think it is interesting to talk about how dune 2 points back to it in some ways and subverts mm-hmm. it in other ways um but i think the, the, the power of the story really does come from those messianic yearnings that we all have. That's well said. I think we'll leave it there because that's a great distillation of what both pulls at us in this film or these films and what also is not satisfied by these films. Yes. Um, we have the same desire the disciples had. We're not reading the disciples from the from the bleachers with popcorn and cheese nachos and going, you stupid idiots, you thought that you... <laughs> we are the disciples. We yes. want what they want. We have Jesus' word and we're jockeying for power and position at his feet the same. We make all their mistakes. We fall into all their traps. And yet, <laughs> this is the true Messiah. Jesus is the one who doesn't just lead us on a conquest at the end of all time. Jesus is the one who offers us the deepest, thickest, richest forgiveness there is for all the, that bumbling and all those failings and all those sins. So Amen. thankfully, we don't have a, a fake Messiah, apocalyptic figure as in Dune. 
a wonderful story to engage and think through and ponder and turn over. I think Christians should, should do the things we're trying to do here imperfectly. We have a better savior. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Joel. This has been uh, an episode of Grace and Truth. Please do subscribe to the podcast on all platforms. And remember, we have the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of grace and truth. John one seventeen. God bless you.